Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Kreisis, and welcome to the next installment of Nielsen IQ's Founder Series. This new video series will dive into the many facets of launching a CPG brand, from perfecting the formulation to securing a meeting with retailers, from getting on a retailer's shelf to scaling the business. Each episode will shine a light on the challenges and successes of startup CPG brands. Joining me today to share his story as a CPG founder is James Bellow, co-founder and CEO of Shameless Pets. Welcome, James. Hey, Andrew, how's it going? Good, uh, happy to have you here and really excited that we caught up at Expo East. Um, obviously, I know a little bit about you guys, but I would, I would love for just the audience and those listening in uh, to know a bit more. So to start off, can you just share a little bit of who you are, what's the story, how did you create uh, Shameless Pets? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was awesome seeing you as well and excited to do this. So um, so my name is James Bello. Um, was a co-founder, am a co-founder here at Shameless Pets. Prior to that, uh, my kind of origin story is I was at Target's headquarters up in Minneapolis. Um, was there on and off for about 12, 13 years, um, predominantly in the merchandising ring. So kind of buyer, senior buyer. Um, and was looking over one of my stints was looking over the produce section and and kind of you know saw that build out as target was rolling out uh produce to over a thousand stores and one of the things that i saw was just the vast amounts of food that was being thrown away um, yeah no, no fault of target just within grocery in general mm -hmm. just all of that food that was being tossed out and um, it really hit me as like, what's happening to that food? Um, and that put me down a, a path of just doing a lot of research around just kind of food system and, and food waste in general and started mm -hmm. talking to farmers, started talking to food processors, started, started talking to pretty much anybody all the way down to consumers and just started to understand, um, where, where the issue really lied and, and started to come up with some, some pretty crazy numbers on how much food was really being thrown away in the U.S. and then yeah. the environmental impacts of that. And, and once that kind of hit, and I've always had this entrepreneurial spirit, um, okay. you know, it was like, all right, like I finally, finally figured out what I want to do, which was I wanted to go tackle food waste. So that was, that yeah. was kind of the, the mission um, first on the brand it was let's yeah. go with that. And I got, I got lucky enough. I honestly, I mean, like I said, I was, I was at Target. So I was sitting behind the desk as a buyer. I had no idea how to formulate a product or, or do anything <laughs> um, but I got lucky to meet my co-founder. Her name is Alex Waite. And she was the head of R and D of a brand called Mary's Gone Crackers. And, um, okay. the two of us, oddly connected over food waste and then, uh, and, and dogs as well. Yep. And that's really where we, we came up with this is we wanted to go tackle food waste. We started to scan the market. We said, you know what, like pets would be an awesome spot to do this in. Um, no one, no one had been doing it. Um, yeah. We saw this trend of humanization within the pet world. And, and our bet was that the younger generation was going to start owning pets and, and kind of transpose what they were doing in the human snacking world, which is kind of better for me, better for the planet, sure. transparency. Um, into into pet food and that off we off we went <laughs> trying to figure it all out and, um, and ultimately then started Shameless Pets, which focuses on upcycling food. So fighting food waste first. All of the food that we're rescuing has a functional health benefit for dogs and cats. And just uh, we now have four different product lines of dog treats, two product lines of cat treats, and just kind of right now just continuing to grow the brand and. And continuing to to fight food waste and, and try to rescue as much food as we possibly can. I love it. I mean, it's such an amazing mission. I love the fact that you started with something that was you deeply connected to, right? That you felt was needed in the marketplace. You saw an adjacency in some of the human consumption, then took that strategy. Um, and it sounds like you just said, "Let's go!" Like this, yeah, this yeah, is going to yeah, happen. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. High level. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's 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 jump into the details here. So. Um, what you had the concept, you, you met your co-founder, um, what were the key steps that you took to actually creating the product? Like, how did you get to the formulation and create that first packaged product ready to go in store? Yeah, it's awesome. Awesome question. A lot of, a lot of steps uh, <laughs> to boil it down for us because of upcycling, we had to start yeah. first and foremost up on the, up in, within the supply chain and, and really go convince 
Right. At that time, it was mainly farmers that they should work with some, you know, some brand, some company that they've never heard of because there's oh. a lot of kind of quality controls that we have to put in place to make sure um, that we can then go upcycle those ingredients. So that was sure. that was us kind of using our Rolodex, so to say, and, and trying right. to, to talk and convince um, that side of things to, to be able to work with us. And then we quickly had to turn it to um, Coman. So, right, we had to yep. then go convince a co-man. Lucky enough for us, because we had Alex, she was able to do a lot of the formulations, uh, just okay. given, given her expertise and, and background working with co-man. But we had to go s- basically sell ourselves to, to different co-mans and kind of convince them that they should work with yep. us. We're, you know, we're somebody that's not just going to go out of business and, and not pay them. Uh, right, after right. Their production run. So there was, so that was pretty much the, the next step that we had to do. And then, I would say almost congruently with that, we were, you know, developing our pitch deck and going and starting to talk okay. to retail because, you know, for us, you know, we were fully bootstrapped for the first couple of years of our existence. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last thing we wanted to do was run production and then have inventory sitting there without, without yeah. any sales channel whatsoever to, to have. So we were kind of doing all, all of those steps pretty much congruently. And, um, you know, looking back, like, got pretty lucky that they all kind of uh hit a similar phase yeah um and, and all came came to fruition at a similar time which was which was good for us but really like um you know i think looking back at it like we started really really early talking to retailers be- uh, honestly before we even had our product uh yeah interesting yeah we actually we actually uh essentially got a po without even having packaging and product made just wow. and that kind of allowed us to then kind of go all in with, with our money and, and go then actually run production. And so how, um, let, let's double click into that one. Um, who was that first retailer that you engaged with? And then, you know, who was that first large retailer um, that took you to the next level? Like, how did that take place? Yeah, so um, awesome, awesome question. Uh, so we're out of Chicago. So we had a couple co-ops who, yep. you know, honestly, we were, I was just, walking and, and talking to them and, and trying to convince them. Some of them didn't even carry pet products at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had, we had some co-ops who, who said yes to us, oh. mm-hmm. um, which was great. And that kind of allowed us to then make that first production. But then at that same time, we had central market down in Texas say, okay. yeah. So yeah. that was like the complete opposite side of things on right. said yes, but they wanted to go really fast. And then that was kind of our entry point into working with Kehi as a distributor, which was was very new awesome. to me as well. So it was, um, so we had kind of, so to say, light at the end of the tunnel that we could have some yep. velocity that could come through ba- based on the manufacturing runs that we had. Yeah, no, that's great. And then, um, so I imagine, right, you went from kind of a local co-op, you started to get some bigger uh, retailers um, interest in your product. Um, what challenges did you feel like? What, what was the biggest roadblock to really getting to where you are now? Um, I'm sure there's like a hundred, right? Yeah, like, oh man. <laughs> but, I, uh... but what one, like, do you feel that for other, you know, founders or startups was the most significant for you that you could share, like how you broke through it? Yeah, I think for, I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot. Um, but I think for, for me and really like, to, to your point on sharing with other founders, um, I kind of lost sight in the beginning of why we were doing what we were doing. It was just, you know, as I was telling the story. Um, but when I've talked to retailers, being a former retailer, like you need yeah. you need to focus as an emerging brand on incrementality and white space yeah. and assortment. And I think like mm-hmm. one of the roadblocks that I had was was that like, I almost just forgot about that. And it was very much like, because you have like, you know, your cash is coming out of your pocket right, right. Your inventory, and you've got this like urge to sell and, and whatnot. I stepped, when we stepped back and was able to actually put together a pitch to articulate the mission that we were on, as well as the incrementality we would bring in the, in the white space that we were filling around sustainability and bringing that kind of new customer to their set, that really yeah. opened it really open kind of the floodgates, so to say, for us and, and bringing on a lot of what I would call more of like your larger regional and then national retailers sure. to, to come on board. And um, and then ultimately, obviously, proving that out was, was a key was a key point to, uh, for us, like, you know, mm-hmm. call it six to nine months later and making sure that we had the marketing. And I would say 
that was another yeah. roadblock for us is like, you know, we could say one thing, we could talk about incrementality, but then how, how do we show that? And, and for us just being a small brand was like, how do we get the data? How do we get the insight yeah. to be able to articulate that to them? And, you know, tr truth be told in those early, in those early months and um, whatnot, it was a lot of kind of gut more, more yeah, than yeah, scra like, scrapping real, it together, like, like, we, real, we real data, but like, as we were able to grow, we were then able to show that and then show the success stories that we had across multiple retail to just bring others on board. Yeah. I love, so it, it's so unique that you were both on the retail side and then jumped into the, the brand side. So it's almost like you had to flex that side of your brain, brought it back into leveraging it, thinking about incrementality. Can you just share an example? Like how did you early on share that incrementality or build confidence that you were truly going to be incremental to the category, you know, on shelf? Yeah, no, it's, yeah, we, you know, again, a lot of it is kind of sto storytelling, um, yep. being able, like putting your buyer hat on and thinking about what the planogram looks like, um, getting an understanding of like what the buyer is looking to do from a strategy perspective on, on where mm -hmm. to grow. Um, and then being able to, to clearly articulate that, you know, you could see trends within the marketplace for us, it was really around sustainability and health yep. and being able to articulate sure. that they're just there was no brand or no offering for that, for that consumer um, mm -hmm. and, and being able to kind of showcase that um, in a really clear and concise way for them that, that made it almost a no brainer. Cause I always tell people like as a, as a former buyer and as a buyer, like buyers are always looking to say no right away. Just <laughs> the brand saying, you, you, heard, know, you heard it first here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, the like, truth, the truth comes out. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, so many brands, you know, basically banging down the door that it's just, you know, you're exactly. looking for a no uh, right away. So being able to like clearly articulate that and, and showcase it on planogram for them uh, yeah. was pretty key. Yeah, I love that. And, and now obviously the, the landscape has changed with some of the stuff that we're doing from a data standpoint to give access to some of these emerging brands. But can you share a little bit more about how now when you're looking at the business, how are you leveraging data or how have you in the last year or two to help give you insights, but then keep telling your story and keep growing in the way that you are? Yeah, so so we can obviously look at like unit velocities, dollar velocities yep. um, is is really helpful for us. We can show showcase um, kind of week on week growth, and then transpose that to where the category is at, and then subcategory as well. So we can start to do that, and then we also can talk panel data with with buyers as well, and kind of showcase like who that customer is who's who's coming in, and, and yeah. assuming the the retailer has that offerings to, to be able to not only talk about just kind of what's happening at shelf, but more importantly, in my mind for a buyer is who that, who that consumer is yep. and then how we're bringing that consumer to the shelf. And, and hopefully it's not only, it's not just trading between SKUs, right. it's also a trade up and, and it's incremental uh, to the category. So, so being able to kind of like bring all of that together and, you know, through data, because I think that was my biggest learning coming from the retail side to startup brand side is just you're inundated with data on the retailer side. And as a startup, you have nothing. <laughs> so <laughs> yep. You're like selling a hope and a dream. Um, right. So be, and, and knowing that all the other national brands are just, you know, articulating it so clearly and concisely exactly. with data yep. that being able to then actually have something to, to kind of more formalize what you're talking about and formalize the story, like just kind of gives the confidence to the buyer that you know what you're, you know what you're doing um, and that they can kind of trust bringing you in and, and yeah. letting you go. I think that's such a key point is like building the confidence and trust. And it is almost, it's making the job easy for the buyer by coming with the data and insights. And I think the other thing that you hit on was it's not just, you know, your sales or, or what's transacted, but knowing the consumer. And, and so, you know, I talk a lot about loyalty, the shopper, looking at the basket size, like repeats or demographics. So important to know that factually, right. To then back up and give that confidence, which it sounds like you guys have done a, a really good job of. Yeah, to totally. I mean, we, we can showcase at certain retailers when Shameless Pets is in the cart, what the total basket looks like yeah. versus rest of brand. We can, we can tell you kind of who our core consumer is, their income level, yeah. demographic, like, and, it, and then related to what the category average is to be able to tell that story. And, and that's really what we just continue to, to hone in on. And, and, and frankly, as a buyer, I mean, that's, that's the most important part because 
I always say an emerging brand is not going to displace a large national brand, right? So that they don't mm -hmm. expect you to, to overtake them. The, the key is just bringing mentality. Yeah. Now, so uh, before I get to my last question, flash forward a couple of years, where, where are Shameless Pats, Pats? Where are you taking it? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> you, you want the vision, huh? I want the vision. Uh, yeah. I love it. I always, I always say we want want to be the Patagonia pet I parent. love that. Uh, we, we, yep. want to, we want to take upcycling as a through line. We, we want, I want to, you know, Alex and I, we want to get it out of, you know, just treats and, and food and, and bring it into um, grooming. We've got, we've got yeah. some, you know, over the next year, your pregnancy, Shameless Pets launch a few grooming products. And then we've got some hard goods ideas, but all through the, with the through line of, of upcycling and sustainability and, and kind of yep. doing that, but, but having fun with it as well. Yeah, and it's such it is a it is a growing consumer demand. So I think you're 100 leading the trend here. Um, and yeah, let, let me know when it drops. I'll be uh, <laughs> adding it to my cart. Um, awesome. La last question for you. Any final advice you'd give to you know a new founder listening to this um, to this video who's maybe embarking on a, on a journey? Yeah, uh, a lot of, a lot of advice. But I would say the one that I think. Um, new founders should absolutely do is ask questions. I think um, what I learned as I, as I did this was asking questions and asking for help is, is somewhat, um, I, I would say it's not the easiest thing, at least for me to go out and do, because you want to yeah. give this, yeah. you give this like halo that you, you're, you're an expert and, and you know what you're doing because it's your company and it, it's somewhat of your baby. But um, what yeah. I found is asking questions, asking, asking advice, asking for help, people really bend over backwards um, to, to help you out as a, as a new startup and a new founder. And it's been super, super beneficial for me and Alex as we've gone through this journey. So um, kind totally. of bring the guard down and, and let people know where you're at and, uh, and ask for help. And I'd say more times than not, people will, will really bend over backwards and help you. Yep, I think spot on. You, you, gotta, you gotta ask and you have it, gotta have the confidence to put yourself out there. Um, and I think you see it, right? We were at Expo East. There's lots of people willing to help. Um, yeah. so that's a great, great point of advice. All right. Well, thank you, James. Uh, such cool. an awesome story. Love the vision. Um, can't wait for more drops from a product standpoint and uh, excited on where you're going. Awesome. So this has been another episode of the Nielsen IQ Founder Series, where we dive deep with some of the most innovative brands and founders to unpack how those brands launch and how they grow in the CPG space. This video was brought to you by Nielsen IQ, where we are revolutionizing the CPG industry and democratizing data and analytics for emerging brands. To learn more, check out nielseniq.com slash Pfizer, B-Y-Z-Z-E-R. Thank you.